Okay, well, we're going to talk about the James Webb today. Uh, let's see, why I'm clicking, yeah. But I do have other talks. So if you're interested in art or science and you know any group that would like to hear about them, why let me know. I'll be happy to uh, show up. Of course, my fee is zero. So uh, it works out fine for We're going to talk about the James Webb Space Telescope today. I went forward or backwards. That pesky down there. Oh. Oops. Oh. Okay, why build the James Webb? Well, a whole variety of reasons. Better understand our universe. Where do we come from? I have no idea. Why are we here? I have no idea. What is our future? We can guess a little bit about that. Uh, the James Webb is a very carefully uh, constructed huge telescope. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. I'll give you a little bit of background history also, though. It's the first multi instrument uh, is going to be completed. Uh, the sixth stage of aligning of NASA's James Webb Space Telescope to its scientific instruments has concluded, while the mid infrared instrument continues to cool down. Optics teams have successfully aligned the rest of the observatory's onboard, onboard instruments to the web's mirrors. And uh, we'll give you a little bit of a brief history. We'll talk about some past telescopes. We'll show you some of the newest telescopes. And then we'll talk about the James Webb Telescope and its location and why it's there. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the instruments, their uniqueness and their capabilities but not too much detail about that because I don't understand a lot of that stuff and you wouldn't be interested probably in most of it, but we'll show some of the capabilities and what it looks like. Uh, and it's really an impressive instrument uh, and the location is a large part of uh, why it's there. It's on. Still not, there we go. Uh, I used to think there's just a couple of satellites up there for radio and television and so on, but there's a huge number of telescopes all kinds of countries, Europe, China, everybody seems to be putting up something or other for some reason or other. And these are not just the, the uh, satellites that are up there to give you your television. Uh, so there's a lot of studies up there. And uh, I don't want to go into too much detail about that. Uh, here's a timeline. Whoops. This is a timeline. And here's some of the uh, various satellites that have been put up. You probably recognize Hubble as being a very popular one that we pretty much know about. Uh, there's one that's been ongoing for quite a long time and most people don't know about. It's this one, I'll show you a picture of that. It's in an airplane that gets above most of the atmosphere and is making continuous observations. Uh, the James Webb is the one that was just put up recently and it's starting its history here, uh, but it was started construction quite a while ago. This is one of the uh, telescopes that's put up but went out of control. That's one of the problems that you have. It was an X-ray telescope, really. Uh, I think it has since crashed into the atmosphere and come down. Uh, here's a new star, X-ray spectrum. Uh, went out March 2022. I'm sorry? Who put that up? I really don't know. It's probably a consortium of people that put that up. Oh, we're getting the thumb in the right places here. <laughs> I'm not sure who put that up. Um, a lot of these are put up by groups of people because uh, they're very expensive and lots of different uh, organizations want to get information of different sorts to analyze. So they combine uh, to put something together that's going to be able to uh, help everybody get what they want. This is the one that I pointed out. Oh my, this one. Uh, this is an airplane, and they open up a hole in the side. They get above most of the atmosphere, and uh, then they're able to take uh, pretty good infrared pictures um, of stars out there. This is uh, the visible picture that you would see, and this is the infrared. The resolution doesn't look so good, but they're getting different kinds of information uh, from it. There's a whole bunch of space telescopes. This is just a few. 
Uh, some of them I think you'll recognize the Hubble telescope down here, of course, has gotten a lot of publicity in this country. And it's been serviced many times. It's in Earth, low, fairly low Earth orbit. Uh, so it's able to have people go up and exchange the camera, the lenses, and different things on board uh, to change the capabilities, increase the capabilities. Uh, the Kepler telescope tests, the Webb telescope we're going to talk about, uh, W first is coming along. There's all kinds of telescopes out there. Different range of uh, things. Some of them are already out of uh, use, so they uh, have stopped servicing them and studying them. And that's going to be uh, in the mid 20s, the last one that's up there. I don't know what the capabilities is of some of these or why they are there. Particularly, that's kind of another whole study. The Plum Telescope, European Space Agency mission with significant participation from NASA, launched into space in May 2009, now orbits the second Lagrange point. We'll talk a little bit about that later of our Earth Sun system, about 930,000 miles away. The Kepler telescope was set up to put uh, something in the sky that could locate planets around other stars. And that's what its particular mission was. Uh, it found 2,662. So other planets around stars are not unusual at all. And it was finally retired in October of 2018. So it's no longer being uh, very effective for this thing. Let me add a little bit of the scale to things because we're just in our galaxy. And uh, here is our sun. And uh, Kepler. My phone is too big or something. Uh, this is the Kepler search area. So it's even a small fraction of our galaxy. And of course, our galaxy is quite far from other galaxies. Uh, so we don't get a lot of detail from other galaxies, but we do learn uh, some significant things from them. Spitzer Space Infrared, launched in 2003, ended in 2020. Here are some of the pictures that it took. Don't compare them directly with something else you don't notice too much. Also, some of the things that are put in here, you don't see some of the infrared aspects of it. Uh, those are more picked up by instruments that are there rather than just by pictures. There is some film that's sensitive to infrared, but probably not the far infrared. Just a variety of pictures. Some of these are just pretty, and those are the ones they publish in the magazines. Uh, but there's a lot of science that's done both with these pictures and with a lot of other information that they glean from the uh, from the instruments that they have on board the uh, telescope. This is the uh, Spitzer, the Planck, the Kepler telescopes. And NASA extending three missions affiliated with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, the Kepler, the Spitzer, and the US portion of the Space Agency's Planck mission. So there's a lot of stuff going on, up to going backwards again. Spitzer revealed the first known system of seven Earth sized planets around a single star. So we're not the only planetary system that has multiple planets going around the star. The Planck surveys the whole sky to learn more about the birth of our universe. Thanks to NASA's Kepler mission, we know super Earths are ubiquitous in our galaxy. We still know very little about them. Herschel Space Telescope, just showing you a couple of the things, has a sun shield. Wide field infrared space telescope to be launched in the mid 20s, the first design to directly, to directly image exoplanets and debris disks in other solar systems. To find out if there's other systems out there are similar to ours, we might even be able to characterize well enough to tell whether we would expect life to be on some of those uh, exoplanets or not. Okay, we get to the James Webb, and this gives a pretty good indication of how big it's going to be or how big it is. Uh, with the people here in the uh, foreground. Of course, it's all put together in a clean room. First, let's get some size comparisons about how big the universe really is. I think that's sometimes helpful. It's not always easy to get a feel for that. If our sun is the size of a quarter, the nearest star would be 400 miles away. That's over in New Mexico someplace. 
our solar system is a quarter, our galaxy is all of North America. Our solar system orbits the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, at more than 500,000 miles per hour. Uh, if you want to be picky, it's 537,000 miles per hour. And of course, we don't notice that particularly, partly because we don't have anything to really refer to, uh, and partly because we're long for the ride, so we're all going that fast. So the galaxy the size of a quarter, the next nearest galaxy is about a foot and a half away. So there's lots of galaxies throughout our universe. And they're really not that far away, but if it's a trouble to get to the next star, it's going to be really difficult to get to the next galaxy. Fortunately, light has a lot of information on it, so we're able to find out an awful lot about all of those things way out there, even though we can't physically travel to them. Uh, if you want to get more information in detail about the James Webb, uh, this is the website. And uh, you can go on easily on Wikipedia or something and find out what the website is. You don't have to copy this down. Uh, and there's a lot more information. Uh, a lot of it is behind beyond what you're interested in. A lot of it's beyond more than what I'm interested in. And uh, it's almost more detailed than you want to know. But I have picked out some things from that uh, that I'll show you here today. First, let me give you some telescope basics uh, and why the web is so amazing. Uh, certainly, when you have a parabolic mirror, when you have a telescope, you want to be able to reflect light from it to some focal point so you can get an image. And uh, it depends an awful lot on what you coat this uh, parabolic mirror with. If you put it with just white paint, you're not going to get much of a reflection that gives you anything of interest to you, particularly. You'll be able to see it, but it won't do much in terms of forming an image. If you make it out of silver, then if you make it out of silver, then it certainly reflects the visible light that we're pretty much uh, capable of seeing, which is why your bathroom mirror is coated probably with silver, maybe aluminum, maybe some combination, but it's typically that. Uh, if you coat it with gold, then you don't see some part of the spectrum, but you do see the orangey part of the spectrum. And also it turns out a lot of the infrared that our eye is not able to see, even though the mirror uh, out of with a gold reflector, reflector on it uh, is able to reflect a lot of the other longer wavelengths that were not visible to us that our instruments can pick up. Okay, the Hubble Space Telescope, this is a picture of it. Uh, it's been up there for a long time. Uh, the accuracy pointing, the width of a human hair at the distance of about a mile. So that's why you get this read uh, that it takes of the universe. Originally, of course, you probably remember, uh, you're all old enough to remember when they first put it up, somebody screwed up and they focused the mirror at the wrong wavelength, at the wrong uh, focal point. So they had to go up with a correction and uh, then we get much, much nicer, better images. But that's the advantage of having it in a fairly low earth orbit. Uh, people can actually go up and change things there. So they put a corrective lens on it just like you have optics in front, wearing glasses in front of your uh, eye that's uh, got a distorted lens as you get older or whatever. Um, this is an indication of um, one of the repair missions there. Astronauts repaired in December 1993, including in that trip, there have been five astronaut servicing missions to the Hubble since its fifth and Final repair mission in 2009. The scope has made over 1.4 million observations, located distant swirling galaxies, and plotted pockets of dark matter. This is a fantastic look at the detail, and you can see a lot of stars uh, right through the uh, filmy area of this galaxy. The deep sky location, uh, the Hubble was taken over by a a person, uh, and he decided that one of the first things he would do would be to point the Hubble in some direction and just let it look in that direction for about three days, a really long exposure, and see what we see. And what they wanted to do was pick some place that was empty space, as far as we could tell, and see if there really is anything there or not. And you probably are well aware that what showed up in this small thing was a lot of stuff. This is the Hubble Beat Field 
and just about everything there except maybe this one uh, star here in the front uh, was a, uh, a galaxy. This is a little bit bigger blow up of that. And uh, it includes galaxies that were formed four to 800 million years after the Big Bang. So they're old enough, they're far enough away that they're old enough uh, that they really go way, way back toward the beginning of time. And they decided, well, maybe that was just unusual. So they went down to the Southern Hemisphere and they did pretty much the same thing. And so this is the Hubble South deep field, and this is the Hubble North deep field, and they're pretty much the same. Screwed up here. A little closer detail. The first full color images from the James Webb will be released on July 12th. So I'll show you a couple of things that they use for alignment, but for the most part, the really good stuff, like these Hubble pictures, uh, similar to in quality to Hubble pictures, uh, will be released July 12th. Okay, what do we expect? That today we're going to talk about the expectation, expectations of the web. We're going to talk a little bit about its design. I'm going to try to keep my thumb off of this long thing here. We're going to talk about the construction. We're going to talk about the launch. We'll talk about where it's going to be located in the universe in our close to the Earth in our uh, orbit around the sun. And uh, unfortunately, we'll have to wait to see those first photos sending back. Uh, remember that fantastic Hubble photo? I think these should be at least as interesting, but we'll soon see. This gives an indication of the size and also of the support team uh, to create the Hubble. Uh, there's an awful lot of science that goes into a lot of very technical uh, aspects of it that bring it to the achievement uh, expectations that we have. But the size is kind of amazing. If you look at the mirror there, uh, it's huge compared to anything else that we've put up in space so far. This is the Hubble. And of course, this is the James Webb. And the color is different for a reason. It's plated pretty much with gold because that reflects the kind of uh, frequency of light uh, that we're interested in looking at. Another indication of the size. Of course, it's a publicity thing that was sent around several places. Here it is in, uh, <clears throat> up at night, New York City probably. And this gives an indication of some aspects of it. I won't go into too much detail here, but uh, you can see that this sun shield um, has several layers. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I'll be showing you some other things that are more interesting and uh, show a little bit more of the details uh, of what's going on. This gives an indication of the Spitzer as well, which is another. Oh, it's just not right here. The Spitzer, the Hubble, and uh, the Herschel. Maybe you don't know about these. I'm not going to spend much time going into them. Uh, you'll notice that these others uh, tend to be silver, and this is gold. That's because this is oriented toward the infrared spectrum, and these are toward the visible spectrum. And backwards again. This breaks out the uh, frequency of light, X-rays, gamma rays, UV, infrared. Here's where our visible is, and the infrared is what makes you feel warm whenever you go out and get the sunlight <clears throat> coming on you. You feel that infrared, and then of course these are all electromagnetic radiations. Uh, so you see the radar with the TV, FM, AM, and so on, as you get into longer wavelengths. Spectrum of light from our sun. And if we take a look at light from a different gal this galaxy, we'll see that it might be shifted a little bit. And the more it's shifted, the faster it's moving away from us, the more it pulls the uh, wavelengths, the wavelength of the light apart. So it stretches that light out a little bit. So it moves it to the reddish uh, direction. 
So this moves this toward the red and actually the amount that it has shifted it gives you an indication uh, of how far it is from it. The faster it's moving, the more distant it is from us because of this relationship between the further away it is, the faster it's moving. Most distant star ever seen was found in the Hubble Space Telescope image. Spotted in the galaxy that existed just 900 million years after the Big Bang, uh, the primordial star Eridel could offer a rare window into the early universe if confirmed by follow-up studies. This is a Hubble photo. Uh, you can see a variety of things here. One of the things, let me point out, one of the things is that you see these little arcs. These are really images of a star that's way back behind here that's being focused by the mass of this huge collection of galaxies in the middle here. So this star is far, far away. The light goes out here. The gravitational attraction of all of these bends space enough that the light comes towards from this direction. And if it's up in this direction a little bit, it still gets pointed toward. So we see these arcs of light because of the mass that's focusing that light from the star way far beyond this uh, collection of galaxies that we're seeing. So there's a lot of stuff that you can see in these things, and you just have to know how to interpret. This is an image of uh, one of the stars, the previous record holder for the furthest individual star ever seen. It was 900 billion years ago, the light left this star and came to us. The left image shows a massive galaxy cluster that sits between the Earth and Ekaris that focused it toward us, bent it toward us. And the panels at right show the viewer in 2011 without a car visible, compared with the star's brightening in 2016. So uh, it's not very visible here, but all of a sudden it gets brighter for whatever reason. So there's a lot of interesting stuff to look at and find out about out there. One backwards here. Usually, she never prioritized the first cycle of observation for NASA's James Webb Space Telescope. So, this is the kind of detailed information that drives information into which research uh, should be done by the telescope when we finally get the web up and running. The Hubble resolution is like this. Web resolution is like this. So, we'll get some incredible information just by the fact that it's up there and has that ability for resolution, in addition to the fact that it can collect so much more light and therefore see stars that are much fainter, much, much further away. In an expanding universe, we need to observe light that has been stretched to longer wavelengths, that is redshifted. I mentioned a little bit about the fact that it moves further away all the time. And, uh, if we look at the time after the Big Bang, this is six billion years, one and a half billion years. Now we're measuring time down here. This is 200 million years, 400 million years, 800 million years after the Big Bang. Here's the Big Bang. And then this is later, and this is where we are over here. This shows different observatories and how far back, how sensitive they were and how far back they could see stars that were so faint and so far away and red shifted so much because they're moving so fast away from us. So this is where the James Webb is gonna take us back just a couple hundred million years after the Big Bang. And remember it's about 500,000 years after the Big Bang that everything settled down and atoms could be stable. So all of a sudden uh, space became transparent. You didn't have this highly ionized plasma uh, which you could now see uh, through space from one end to the other. Comparison of uh, mirror sizes and uh, also the light sensitivity, the infrared is what the James Webb spacecraft is mostly oriented toward. Size is a big help. 
and compare the wavelength sensitivity. And if we take a look at the wavelength here, uh, here's reflection of different materials at different wavelengths. So here's aluminum. Uh, and that's probably what's in the back of your bathroom mirror. Here's silver also. Uh, and these reflect a certain amount, but the infrared uh, of gold is what we're looking for, the reflectivity here. This is 100% reflectivity. And it's the one that goes far, far out into here. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we have gold instead. Okay, here's just another uh, picture of this. And uh, let me point out, these are sunshades to isolate the temperature toward the sun from the temperature of the telescope uh, that's gonna be looking into uh, outer space and the colder it can stay, the more sensitive it can be to the infrared radiation. Uh, it's six and a half meters across. It will circle the sun at a Lagrangian point beyond the moon, and it will not be serviceable. I'll show you that in just a minute. Here's how it was tacked up into the top of a rocket. That's why it had to be in this collapsible mirror. And you can see it tucked inside the upper part of this uh, with all of the uh, reflective panels. And the mirror itself had to be folded back on itself. And it has a uh, rather large package of uh, instruments also tagging along with it. Blast it off. Then it was on packs and ended up, uh, um, it was sent off from place. They tend to do it close to the equator because that gives it uh, some initial impact into or speed to get it into orbit. Uh, then as it went up, uh, a lot of the material that was went uh, fairings to guard it against the atmosphere and so on, uh, break away and you end up with just the telescope itself. And then it also starts to unfold. Uh, this is the position of the web versus the Hubble. You can see this is 238,000 miles. This is about 930,000 miles. So it's almost four times as far away as the Hubble. And of course the Hubble goes around the earth. Uh, the James Webb goes around the sun. And there are two stable Lagrange points in where the earth goes around the sun. So if you put something here, it can be stable, put something here. Unfortunately, the web is gonna be up here. Uh, so it's pretty stable, but we still have to have the ability to uh, Modify it a little bit, its position. It's not going to just stay in there uh, like it would if it were in the stable positions completely. There's a whole bunch of other stuff out there. I won't show you nearly the number of uh, other things that are at these different points, uh, but a lot of people have been putting up uh, scientific instruments to gather information. Of course, you would expect that one in here on this side of this fairly stable point here, it's close to the sun, it's going to hang in there and just study the sun. Uh, but there's all kinds of other things that have been going up uh, by us and by China and by Europeans, uh, by a lot of different people. This is the flight to orbit that it's going to have. And then this is going around the sun. And you'll notice that here it has, uh, this is the Earth, this is the moon, and it's way out beyond the moon and even the orbit around here. I'm not sure how much this is to scale, but I think it's it's an indication uh, reasonably well, I believe. I'm not going to follow this in too much detail, but this is its process of getting out to its position at the L2 point. And uh, the primary mirror assembly is deployed completely about this point, secondary mirror assembly deployment. So it's pretty much out there and in position. Uh, after it's uh, already pretty much disassembled and uh, 
in the format that it's going to be uh, working. Now I just have to sit out there for a while and cool down, get rid of all the uh, temperature that we had from before. Multi instrument alignment starts. 115 days, alignment complete. Imaging verified. Target tracking is ready. 180 days, science operations really begin. So this is just sort of the steps that uh, it's gone through to get out there. Distant star galaxy light path comes in, hits one of these mirrors, bounces out, and then goes inside to the instruments. This is the status. It's already pretty much out here in position. You can go on the you know, description of the instruments. You can go on the web and you can easily find this site uh, to go and find out a description of what's happening to the web at the present situation that it has now. And then also, if you want more detail about the instruments I'm going to talk about a little bit, uh, you can go there and find more than you want to know. Uh, and I found a lot more than I can understand. So. Uh, have fun, but there's a lot of stuff there. Uh, just kind of fun to browse that. This is another indication of the size of it. I show this just because uh, they were selling jewelry, which is an indication of this uh, system of mirrors that it has. And I'll show you that a little bit later when the guy that's telling us about it, it has it pinned to his, uh, his shirt. This is a mirror. It gives you an indication of what the actual size is. This is the back of the mirror. And if we take a little closer, you'll see that it's structurally uh, formed this way so that it has a lot of rigidity, uh, but it's fairly lightweight still. It also has some servo mirrors attached to the back of it so that it can change the radius of curvature. Uh, strut attaches it to the mirror. Waffle plate is three, plate, three pieces. So there's a fancy makeup so that they can control this its attitude compared to the other mirrors and to focus the mirror shape itself. Originally, this is the way it was. And each of these mirrors now, this is the focus of each of those mirrors as it originally was uh, shipped out. And several surfaces must be precisely aligned. So this is what it looked like for the first picture from the web, not too interesting. That, 18 mirrors, 18 dots. Is that okay? That's one image. I'm sorry. That's one image spread around, or 18 yeah, dots. Yeah, I think so. They, they take these and they bring the images. So they they align each of those mirrors to bring it into focus in the, the central central thing. This is the final image that they end up with. So it looks pretty sharp. Uh, Not too bad, better than expected. Ground controllers have been working for months to align the segments to within a few nanometers. Nanometers, maybe late summer before all web instrumentation is calibrated and ready for use. But they will show us uh, some pictures. And this is a comparison of uh, the fact that it's so large, a mirror, uh, it's able to uh, be so much better in resolving things compared to the Hubble. And as you see here, the Hubble, and here you see something that has a quasar that's blowing up and lighting up this part of the sky. And you see a brightness, but you have no idea what that reading might be. Whereas the web is able to resolve that, the Hubble is not able to resolve it. First full color images, spectroscopic data released July 12. But I've told you that several times already. It bugs me because I didn't have it early enough to be able to show you, but I'm going to be eager to look at that on July 12th. Okay, so here's just an indication over time of it cooling down. Uh, the spacecraft plus will be kept warm so that water vapor and outgassing from other parts don't condense on the internal equipment. So there's a lot of uh, concern about the details of how it goes out to this position and how it cools down. They have to be careful about a whole range of things. Uh, there's a lot of science and thought has gone into 
just getting the thing out there in the first place. Use a refrigerator to get it to even lower temperature than the temperature uh, would normally be stable out there at that position. Uh, get it down to a, about a temperature about 70 degrees Kelvin. Instrumentation group. Of course, everybody's in a clean room, so everybody has to wear uh, clean, dust free things. Integrated science module is this location here. Here are all the mirrors over on this side. It hasn't been completely unfolded yet. Well, maybe it has been. It's hard to tell. It. I think they might need two more out here. Uh, and here are the several uh, layers of insulation from heat from this side. Uh, looks like they have a uh, photoelectric uh, gizmo here to be able to uh, generate some electricity. And they can withstand small interruptions to that. This is a thing that I picked up about the Hubble solar panels. And uh, it's in lower Earth orbit. And every once in a while, lower Earth orbit, you get dings, either from junk from other satellites up there, because there's a gazillion satellites out there, uh, or just from some space stuff that's floating through. But even though you get some damage like this, it can still carry on the mission. That doesn't bring everything to an end. So it's resilient to that sort of thing. Every function is duplicated so that if there's a failure, another instrument can take over that function, which is really kind of cool. I mean, if you're doing all this, you want to make sure that it's not going to be dead just because something minor happened. Uh, this is a sort of an indication of the way the things are kind of packed together in all of this uh, thing. I don't want to go through all the details. And if you want to really find out what's in each one of these packages and so on, you can go to that website. Uh, and find out a lot, a lot more, more than maybe you want to know. Uh, it's carefully packaged. Uh, and one of the things that impressed me that I think is pretty straightforward for everybody to understand, in addition to the fact that here's that little pin I was telling you about. So if you want to get one for your uh, friend, why uh, they're available online. I don't know how much they cost, but I didn't try. I'm not interested in selling them. You're not going to have one unless you want one. <laughs> um, okay, I point that out. And looking at detail, this is actually an array of 250,000 micro shutters. Each one of these can be opened and closed. Now, you might, might imagine if you have a star field up there with a gazillion stars in it, and you run that through a spectroscope, a prism kind of thing, they might smear all over each other. Well, then you don't get any information because you don't know which is what. So you have these 250,000 shutters, and you know where each thing is in the star field. So you open the shutter for the particular ones you want to study at that particular time. Incredible, and this is a, this is only a simple thing that they do. Just absolutely amazing. This is James Webb. This is the web, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what they have up there. That's why they're going to be able to sort all that stuff out. And it goes into a little bit about exactly how they're able to handle that. The magnetic stripes on top of the metal layer. Uh, this is toward the detectors. They have a hinge and torsion bar, and uh, so they're able to change this. Prior to an observation, pre-selected shutters are given a small electric charge. A small magnetic field is used to open and latch the shutter. So you can see from here, you open and close some of these shutters and you keep others closed so that in this star field, you only get spectra from the ones that you want. And you know which ones those are, so you can really study the whole thing in great detail. I mean, that's really cool. And they can take spectra, it says here, from up to 100 targets at once. So you have all this mass array of photoelectric things. So you get a massive amount of information in any star field you're looking at simultaneously. So you can imagine there's a huge amount of information transmitted down for these people to be analyzing day after day after day, month after month, hour after hour. I think I just went backwards. This is some of the material packed in, and it's uh, 
They have a beam splitter that sends light into a pair of short and long wavelength channels. So each of these different pieces of equipment in here can work with some of the light from the same star and get different information from it. Uh, so it's incredible amount of information they get from just looking at one star field uh, and several stars at the same time, but from each star, they're able to get a tremendous amount of information about that star or star system. More detailed than you want to know, but if you do want to know, go to their uh, website. I just clicked this off the website, but I'm not going to walk through this. I don't know what's going on enough there to be able to walk through you, but it's kind of interesting to see uh, some of the things and how they put, they have a, uh, a partially coated mirror that puts, they've already put that light through some other information here uh, to collimate it. And then they bounce it and have has half mirrors here that allow it to go into a variety of different instruments. So they can do uh, a lot of analysis with the same uh, light that's coming in. And they have filter wheels. So where that stuff is being divided up, they can use different filters and get a tremendous amount of opportunity uh, for different experiments uh, by using different filters, as well as sending the light that's filtered to several different instruments. Well, when you're spending this kind of money and this kind of effort, you really want to get the most out of it that you possibly can. This is also more than you want to know. Uh, filter wheels separate light by wavelength. Each channel can be optimized for its wavelength. This just sort of shows light passing through a prism or reflecting off a different thing. It just shows some of the complexity of how they have things arranged and organized. That's pretty much close to the last slide I have. But this is another indication of how they're using that light and sending it to many, many different instruments. The bottom half of the instrument houses MRI's medium resolution spectrograph. Each of these are sensitive to different parts of the spectrum. The result is that uh, MRI will see through surrounding dust built by uh, an evolved supergiant, for instance. That's just one aspect. One of the things they can do is they break this light up into different things. And although we see with our eye different color, but if you've already separated out into the different aspects, this is ultraviolet, and this is the brilliance of that. And then that will be uh, studied with ultraviolet sensitive instruments. Here you have visible stuff, which is sort of what we see up here with our, our eye. Uh, and then you have infrared, which is separated out this way, and those go to infrared sensitive instruments. So you break this out and then send the appropriate light to the appropriate instruments. And simultaneously, you're getting a huge amount of information. And when you understand what all of that is in terms of the intensity and such, uh, then you can combine that uh, and with your various theories and conjectures, uh, understand an awful lot more of what there is really out there, what's going on. You can combine those ones that I showed you before. You can combine that, of course, into the final picture. This is what you separated out to get those individual things in the first place. You can put it together, and here you have this beautiful picture of this uh, galaxy. Uh, one of the other things that uh, it can do is get an indication of stars that have planets around them by looking at the dip in the light. Uh, if it stares at this star for a while, and then this planet goes across in front of it, it blocks out some of the light. So you get the possibility of studying that. And it has very sophisticated things so that it's much better than the uh, telescope that we're looking at those kinds of things before. It must have been, oh, 15 years ago, I heard a talk by a woman who was doing this kind of stuff with conventional telescopes. Uh, just by looking at the brightness of, that, of the light from that star, and she could get an idea of what a dip was, but this has so much more sophistication to the spectra analysis and so on, uh, that this will go steps beyond that. And they can, because of the size of the mirrors and so on, they will be able to do this with uh, 
planets around so many more stars that are so much fainter than we could ever do before. Uh, so we're, we're, about asking James Webb. Webb. we're still talking about the James Webb. Right? This is the James Webb. Okay, because I wasn't sure. What it was. Yeah, this is all James Webb. This guy's in a picture with his James Webb thing. It's James Webb. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice that myself until just yeah. now. <laughs> Study material around other stars by blocking this primary thing. So there's some kind of stuff going on here, whether that's just dust in that other orbit or whether it's got some planets buried in. If you look at this for a while, you might be able to determine if there's a planet that's adding to this brightness over here. Whoops. If it's brightness, can't get that thing. If it's, if it's brightness that adds to this from a planet, then that could, fluctuate up and down, and you would get perhaps a period of that planet as it's circulating around that star. So long-term analysis, of all, there's just so much stuff that once you have the information and you record this and make it available, and that's one of the things that was wonderful about uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, that information was put online and it was available to anybody that wanted to go in and analyze it. Uh, so if you had an idea and nobody was willing to fund it, and you were able to do it, you can go and pick up the information and analyze it yourself. So if we take a look at this, this is present, the Hubble. This is 13.7 billion years, 9.2 billion years, Sun, Earth, and solar system was formed 9.2 billion years ago. This is a billion years after the uh, Big Bang. This is 400 million years stars and nascent galaxies formed. Uh, 700 million years after the Big Bang, this particular galaxy was formed. Uh, there's another aspect that I wanted to just touch on here. Webb and Lisa probe further back toward the Big Bang origin of our universe than ever before. And uh, this is Lisa. And I didn't, I wasn't going to talk much about Lisa, but let me just mention uh, that Lisa is the laser interference interferometer space antenna. And Lisa is a huge triangular interferometric system that uh, is very large compared to the Earth and the Moon. And it's trailing along behind us. That's 5 million kilometers across. So that it is able to measure gravitational waves that are very, very long, which the things that we do on Earth, we can't get those really long gravitational waves, but there's a lot of good information in those. So Lisa is going to be uh, put into orbit around the sun with the Earth, and it's going to move around with us. It's at sensitive at frequencies between 300 millihertz and a tenth of a hertz, laser interferometer space antenna. And they've done some experiments. I thought I had another clip in here. They've actually done experiments so that they know that this will work. That is, uh, I think it was Britain that sent up uh, some of the equipment that will be inside, inside each one of these. Okay, let's go back to this. The equipment that is in here, they've sent some of that equipment up into space and they've tested it all and they know that it's going to work. So now they're creating these gizmos uh, so that we'll have three of these and those will be put up. And I'm not sure exactly when it is, but probably within the next 10 years. Three inner, inner parameters, three, three of them? There will be three. And they, uh, they will be kept in location with respect to each other as they go around the earth. And then whenever gravitational waves come through here, very long wavelength gravitational waves, bigger maybe than the orbit of our sun, they are far enough separated and the interference patterns will be slightly moved from each other because they're far, so far away, it will make a significant measurable difference. 
So they'll be able to get down to really very, very long wavelength gravitational waves. So there's a lot of stuff going on up there. I don't know why I included this, but it just seemed so interesting to me. I'm kind of fascinated with it. We saw gravitational waves not so long ago for the first time. It's given us another window into the uh, atmosphere. Uh, and I guess I think that's the last one that I have. Oh, here's five wave James space telescope could change science forever. Do biosignatures exist on nearby super Earths? We haven't seen biosignatures. Are the pristine stars in ultra distant galaxies? Are black holes energetically active in dusty early galaxies? We don't know a lot about black holes, so any information we can get would be quite interesting. Was the universe born with black holes? And so if we look far enough back in the distance, then that goes us back toward the early atmosphere, toward the early universe. And if we're still able to see some black holes there, then we know they were formed pretty shortly after the Big Bang origin of the universe. Uh, and how are dark matter-free galaxies made? Don't know that either. Don't know much to say about that, but now you can go back and find out on your own a little bit about some of this stuff. Do there, there are dark matter-free galaxies? That was news said. to me too. I have to go take a look at that. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised I've never heard of that. that. Yeah. <clears throat> the end. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if I can answer any questions or whatever. Okay, well, thanks for coming. It's always fun to share this stuff.